Welcome to 101. I'm your host, Lee Adams. Today, we're going to talk about a whole bunch of things, sports-related, but life-related, and everything in between. Transitions is going to be one of the themes today. Uh, our guest uh, went to high school at Shenley High School in the city. There's no more Shenley anymore. There's some great athletes that came out of Shenley. Uh, but he went to Shenley High School, then went on to play football at the University of Pittsburgh. He played linebacker, safety, quarterback at the University of Pittsburgh and was signed as a free agent into the NFL, played in the NFL for nine years for the Giants, the Ravens, the Browns, and the New Orleans Saints. He was on the Super Bowl winning team of the New Orleans Saints in 2009, went on to coach at Rutgers at Tampa Bay, and he was a finalist for the James Brown Award, the most outstanding service in the community. He speaks all over the country. He oversees all the Pittsburgh public school athletes. He's an athletic trainer. He's a mentor. He does academic tutoring. He's just done a lot of positive things with the youth in this city of ours and the young people. I'd like to welcome Dornell Dinkins. Dornell, it's great to have you here today. It's great to be here, man. Thank you so much for having me out today. You're welcome. So. Tell us about growing up at Shenley, and, and where did you live? What, at Shenley, you can go live in a couple different places. Exactly. Right? I lived in the Hill District, you, you know, lived which in was the Hill very District. close. Right up the street from Central Catholic, you know. So uh, it, it just, um, you know, when I was coming up, um, all I wanted to ever do was go outside and you know, play sports and, and really just, you know, get kids out and, and do something. I didn't want to sit around. Uh, I remember the first time I was introduced to football, I had a little the electronic football board, which a lot of kids won't know about. You hit the little buzzer and the guys are vibrating. I know about and it. You're putting the quarters and the pennies in their bases and, and allowing them to run and score touchdowns. So I, I became fascinated with a game of football. Um, and as I just c continued to watch, and my mom almost had a point where she wasn't going to let me play because I was, I was a Steelers, Bears, Broncos, and Browns fan. So those were my four teams on my board. So. When the Broncos were playing the Redskins in the Super Bowl, I actually cried when they started losing. It was, you know, and then when Walter Payton lost to the Redskins that year, I cried again. So I couldn't stand the Redskins because two of my favorite players, John Elway and uh, Walter Payton at the time, were put out by the Redskins that year they won. So uh, I, I grew up, you know, just fascinated with the game. And um, ever since I could remember, I would go outside and just emulate every player that I could think of. And um, I didn't really play organized football until I got to Shinley. But up until then, we would go outside, and whether it was linebacker, safety, receiver, quarterback, I was doing something surrounding the football. Oh, so who? What was the makeup of your family, and who was in your family? Oh uh, well, I have a mother, you know, Wendy, um, and it was myself and my older sister, who's five years older than me, and Danelle. Um, as I got into high school, my mom remarried, and uh, we have, I have three younger sisters, you know, two twins, Malika, Malaya, and then Milana. So. That made up my family coming up, but more importantly, like all I could think about was you know, going out. And then I have my, my brother Dave, who's um, who live out in this area. It wasn't like my cousin, but we were like brothers. And um, he came up behind me, and all we ever did was we was like joined at the hip. So whatever I did, he did. And so we were football, basketball, baseball. We were always together, just really understanding that we thought we were the greatest things, you know, out there as far as sports were concerned. And um, it was just a mindset from a young age that we wanted to be playing in the NFL. So who was, who was the main influence of, of yours growing up? I think, you know, as far as the influence, you know, I always, you know, I love my grandma Barbara. I, I think, you know, that's my, my father's mom. And she just always, you know, no matter what the situation or what was going on, she was she's the type of person that you truly say will give you her last you know, dime if she had it. And, uh, and that's her selfless acts of kindness is something that just resonated with me. And um, between her and just, you know, having God, you know, in my life, I'm at an early age. I just was in church. I remember having a situation where, like, everything went white and I kind of was dizzy. I woke up in the bathroom and I just felt like God always had his hand on me regardless of what the situation was around me. Um, I've always found favor in the places I was going. may not have been the situa situation I wanted but it ended up being the way I needed it to be. And I consider myself a lot of the story of Joseph in the Bible. You know, he um, you know, had his family, you know, kind of beat him up, throw him into a jit ditch, and then sell him into slavery. Um, even in the midst of being in slavery and in prison, he always found favor. And he helped a guy who then became a servant to Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh, uh, 
you know, had a dream he couldn't interpret. And the guy who was in prison said, hey, I know this guy who's in prison who helped me. So even in the midst of being in a bad situation, if Joseph wouldn't have did what he knew he was supposed to do, he would have never became second in command of everything because he was the only person that could interpret Joseph, I mean, Pharaoh's dream. So, you know, I, I consider myself that, you know, even sometimes when the road gets a little rockier, you end up somewhere you don't want to be. It doesn't mean that God don't have you in the path that you are supposed to be on. So was there any, any male influence or any guidance in that respect or any discipline growing up for you? There was. Um, I had my uncles around. Uh, my father was in and out. Um, and my grandfather, I really lo my grandfather loved to go out and feed the pigeons. So I thought feeding the pigeons was the coolest thing ever because when he walked outside, the pigeons kind of started coming down and surrounding around him. And at the time, that's kind of, you know, I was like, man, I want to be just like my granddad. But, you know, he, he taught me a lot of life lessons. Um, you know, he, he taught me just, you know, what hard work is. But more importantly, I think I got that from my grandmother. And, uh, you know, and a lot of it was just, you know, wanting to be more than my situation. I grew up in the inner city in the projects, there wasn't much going on, a lot of crime, a lot of violence around. So in the midst of seeing a lot of that around me, um, in, in house and family and, and then in the outskirts, it's just like, I just didn't want that for my life. I see this, I would see the same guy sitting there. I remember walking with my mother and saying, you know what, why is that guy sitting over there homeless? And she was like, cause he just didn't work hard. And at that moment, I knew that regardless of what it took, I was always gonna be willing to you know, work, work hard to get what I wanted. So was school tough for you? School wasn't tough, but like most young kids, uh, I didn't understand the importance of it. You know, and, and this, we talk about socialization. Uh, a lot of things that I do now in the inner city, I don't want to fast forward, but I oversee all the Pittsburgh Public Schools you know, with my company, Ethic. And what we do, we um, help calculate their core GPAs. So now they can know that not only am I a good athlete, but I'm a student athlete. Because if I want to go to college, I need to be a student athlete, not just an athlete. And too many times in our schools, we think that it's cool to sit around or act like we don't know or laugh or be a comedian. I love all the best comedians, Kevin Hart, you know, Louis CK, all the guys. But at the end of the day, they're in intelligent and in what they do, and they get paid a lot of money for what they do. And school is about going to school for your eight hours, getting an education, whether it's you know, math, whether it's science, whether it's English, and really being able to set yourself up for the rest of your life. And so what I love to do now is educate these kids and saying, look, I was a 3.0 kid, but I didn't apply myself a lot of times. A lot of times I was sitting in class worrying about the next football game or basketball game or baseball match, and I could have really set myself up if I was, if I'd applied myself as much as I did to my sport, it would have been good. But you did enough to get into the University of Pittsburgh. Yes. Well, what I realized, um, with our offense, we ran a wing tee. But uh, my junior at Shenley year. Or at Shenley? At Shenley. Shenley. Um, we led, this, led the state in scoring <laughs> as an offense. Um, when I threw the ball, it was, you know, I <laughs> scored through a lot of touchdowns and would run and did a lot. But I understood that at that time, there wasn't a lot of the zone read stuff like it is now. It was a little more conventional, drop back three, five, seven step drops, get the ball out, let your receivers, let your running backs make the plays. So I was like a, trying to put a square peg into a round hole because I had that athletic ability. Now at the time you had quarterbacks like Randall Cunningham, Steve Young that were you know, really mobile you know, quarterbacks, but they were really a lot more drop back passers. So um, in a realm, I was a little bit, you know, before my time, it's right when Cordell Stewart was doing a whole slash thing. I think Pitt was excited about the thought of having maybe a slash type, you know, hybrid at the time. And, um, you know, so I try to teach myself. I taught myself how to do the three and five step drops. I would go to Joe Butler's camps and all the Metro Index camps and all the stuff around the area and would just totally, you know, you know, blow it up and do very well. But at the end of the day, you know, I think teams would see my athletic you know, side of things. I was 6'4", 200 plus pounds, and they seen what I could be. And regardless of how much I wanted to play quarterback, they, they had other you know, plans for me, which I wish I could have seen a little bit earlier. But, um, you know, with all that said, yes, I had a, you know, a strong high school career, ended up being one of the top 100 players in the country coming out of high school, um, having tons of touchdown passes, a lot of yards, um, rushing over 100 something tackles. Um, really did, you know, a lot on the football field and was able to get a scholarship wherever I wanted to and I was able to choose the University of Pittsburgh. So how, how, how about that recruiting process? I mean, you got people coming in, they're telling you how great you are, and, you know, did you have 
anybody around you to help humble you or that's got to blow up a young boy's head and people telling you how great you are. Well, I think humility is part of what makes me me. You know, I don't ever even, I got to be reminded sometimes that I won a Super Bowl. I played in the NFL because I don't see it as anything other than what I've always done. So the ability to be able to go into college and be the first person at the time in my family to graduate from college to me was a blessing in and of itself. So I took it seriously, but at the same time, I was like, well, I used to watch these schools on TV. Now Notre Dame's recruiting me, Penn State, Michigan State, Michigan, like all these schools were recruiting me. And it was, it was kind of surreal to me in a sense. I remember watching the Big 33 and, you know, um, remembering uh, Ron Paul and how big it was around him when he was coming out as a quarterback. But then I'm going to be playing this same Big 33 game. And, you know, it just, it just really was surreal kind of the whole thing where I almost looked at myself like I was looking at myself through a window. And when it's all said and done, you know, I don't think I've ever, you know, be, got you know, big at it. I think what I really wanted to do was just not be a failure, which is the, the, the flip side of it, which is made, what made me work so hard. When I, when I was getting recruited, I didn't want to be a guy who didn't pan out. I didn't want to be a guy who um, didn't end up being successful at what he did. So now that these schools want me, now i got to prove that I'm worth keeping. So how did you make the decision? You, you could go to almost really, literally any school in the country and I don't know who you had around you to, to help you. And, and how did you make the decision to go to the University of Pittsburgh? Well, one of the biggest things with my company now, Ethic, which stands for Effort, Toughness, Heart, Intensity, Commitment, those are five qualities that doesn't mean a 40 or a speed, um, a vertical. It's how you play the game. And your heart in between your ears. I'm 6'4", 275 pounds. I can run. Probably a four six four five still today before I blow both my hamstrings. How old are too you? Old. I'm 37. You think you could run four what? A four six. Today. Today, I will hurt myself out the words. <laughs> yes, um, I could bench press 275 20 something times still today, but the best muscle I ever strengthened was between my ears, and at the time I didn't have anybody helping me. You getting all these letters from all over, talking to all these schools. We didn't have cell phones or, you know, social media, which has changed the game of recruiting. But the biggest thing, what I do now, with going around all of the schools, um, speaking about the recruiting process, is the simple fact that a lot of kids and parents don't know what it takes. They don't know that you need 16 core credits. They don't know that you need at least a minimum of a 2.0 GPA. Or those core classes don't include gym or wood shop. It's English, four years of English, three years of math, two years of social studies, two years of natural physical science, one year of additional English or math, and four years of a foreign language, the total 16 core credits, and that's what calculates your GPA. But if you don't know that stuff, you'll be going over it thinking it's just athletics. And I didn't have anybody to help me along with that process. So at Shinley, I was in, they had me in some remedial courses, but now that some big schools are coming out, now they had to, you know, bump me up to some, you know, some standardized courses that's going to register with the NCAA. So there's a lot of things that you need to, you know, learn before you get to that senior year that I was kind of, I was learning and flying by the seat of my pants. And fortunate enough, I was an intelligent kid, so I could you know, do the things that was needed. But there's a lot of kids, a lot of kids in this country. And the reason why I speak all over now, from my situation and from situations like I was recruiting a kid when I was at Rutgers where a kid had a 1.8 GPA, the top defense to end in the country, 1.8. That's like doing nothing in a classroom. So when I was coming up and what drives me to do what I do now, was that simple question that you asked me was the fact that I had nobody really helping me through the process. My mom was trying to figure it out, but she'd never been through it before. And we kind of were just trying to, you know, how do you, how do you stay humble? How do you decide with school? And how do you make sure you're academic, academically compliant? Now, what kids need to understand now is that in recruiting, they get your transcript, which have all your grades from ninth to 12th grade year. Then they get your social media page, which is, if you're doing a lot on your Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, which is changing the game of recruiting, these two components is what really coaches look for before they even start recruiting you. And if, what are, I always ask kids, what are those two things saying about you? Now, when I was getting recruited, it was more to send you a letter. We get a VHS tape, which kids won't even know what a VHS tape is, you know, in a couple of years. Well, if, they already, if they probably already don't know. But these are the things that schools really look for when they were, were recruiting me. So I was kind of going into a blind and really didn't have a basis on what I wanted to get out of my college experience. So how did you choose Pitt? 
I chose Pitt because one, it was local, and at the time, it was kind of a weird story, but I was scared to death of airplanes. So when it came to going to Texas or North Carolina and they had flights, I was kind of like, oh, I'm kind of worried. So um, I chose Pitt when I, I seen a program that I felt was on the verge when Johnny Majors kept coming to my house and he, he had come back and said, you'll be our number one guy, our quarterback, you know, you're a guy that we want there. And um, I believed the hype, you know, I believed what they said. And then um, my first week at, at Pitt, they had me playing, you know, receiver and tight end, and, you know, so, you know, I believe the hype of what they said, but, you know, it's a song and dance, and that's why I try to get kids to understand, you know, it is such, it is such a, you know, a, a courting situation where, you know, you get court, they tell you whatever you want to hear until they get you there, and so, you know, I had to understand that, and it was, it took a while for me to understand that these guys wanted me just for the athlete that I was, the drawing other top-notch athletes. And I had to get used to that. But at the end of the day, what made me choose, I was close to picking Virginia Tech or Michigan State, and they really, really wanted me. And I ended up going with you know Pitt, just for the simple fact that I knew that my family would be able to see me play. You could, put, you could walk to Pitt from your house. I could throw a rock you know, and hit one of the coaches in the head, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Back then, but now they're on the south side, so I can't do that. Well, now the Michigan State coach is now the pit coach. Yes, which is crazy. I mean, I think I hope he does well. You know, people ask me, what do I think about Pitt or, you know, what they're going to be going through? I say what college recruiting. It truly is about your prestige and how consistent the turnover is with the, with the school. Case in point, if you got a coach who's always leaving or somebody who's in and out, it's hard to get kids to commit to that program. But if you get a system where the coaches are there, you know, the Alabamas and, and where the coach is there and they know that coach's staff is going to be there. You know, I, I used to always tell kids at Rutgers, college is not a one-year commitment, it's a four- to five-year commitment. But on top of that, you need to make sure that co coaches are committed to those four or five years because it only take one new coaching staff to come in and now with one coaching staff like you as, they may not like you no more. You know, so you really got to understand where you're going to and what the coach's direction is because it could change and it could change and really be an issue for you know, kids who may be there. So I think that kids getting as much information from the coaches as they can. Now, a coach can't help but if he gets, you know, promoted or, you know, gets upgraded. I mean, you know, uh, this is part of the game like Coach Chris. I mean, he was here, uh, opening comes, happens at Wisconsin a former Wisconsin guy, and boy, that's something that you got to look at on the front end. But it happened, and, and that's kind of where the cookie crumbles. So, you know, you talk about over the last five, six years, there's been over three or four coaches at University of Pittsburgh. So with that being said, you know, you got to really be able to have consistency to get a lot of these young kids now. So let's say you have a kid that's you know, good in the classroom, mm -hmm. has a lot of offers, and what would you, what would you, how would you mentor that kid on how to make that decision? Well, I'm going to... I'm gonna put it to a kid that <laughs> that you may know um, that I actually you know help right now. David Adams is an outstanding linebacker um, related to you, obviously, uh, who works with me, and he's getting a ton of offers. And from the time I seen him play, I told him that you won't need to go around to a lot of these camps. You know, a lot of camps are big on bringing people in and doing these things. What you need to do is just keep playing football because at the end of the day, it's about football players making plays. It's not about what your 40 is. It's not about what your vertical is. It's about when it comes to it, if you're a linebacker, can you strike a guy and knock him off the screen? When you're a defensive lineman or offensive lineman, can you gain ground or do you lose ground? It's a, it's a game of inches. You know, um, as you're a quarterback, can you complete passes? Can you complete passes on the rest? Or can you not? If you're a running back, can you find a hole? Do you, do you, are you a smart running back? Are you always looking for the big play? Are you just third and two? Are you trying to get a 20 yard run and end up losing five? Or do you know to get three yards and keep the sticks moving? If you're a receiver, do you keep your shoulders over your knees? You got a good base and balance. So all the things that, you know, the schools are going to look for. So if there's a kid with a lot of offers that has good grades, the best thing that that kid can do is keep knocking out in the classroom. Because what will happen is that you need to, be the eligibility center to accept you as far as NCAA, whether you're a qualifier or non-qualifier. But then once you become a qualifier, to give you an example, right now as it stands, the minimum requirement is a 2.0. 
with that 2.0 in your core classes, which is those 16 core credits, you need to at least score at least a 10, 10 on the SAT. But starting August 1st, 2016, that requirement is gonna go from a minimum of a 2.0 to a 2.3 GPA, and now you have to score 1080 on the SAT. Now people say 1080 on the SAT, there's three parts to the SAT, the reading, the math, and the written component. That's only a two part score in the reading and the math component. The written component is not included in that 1080. So for a kid right now who's a really good football player, and just like I said, if I relate to David Adams, he is an outstanding, it's a tremendous linebacker. Not even, not even the average, probably above average for the way he plays and strikes opponents. So the best thing that he can do for himself with the way he plays is just keep knocking out in the classroom and then he will be able to go to whatever school he wants to. If the classroom is an issue, if there's a kid who's probably around a 2.1, 2.2, 2.0, now you're looking at school saying, no, we really like them, but we got three guys over here who has 3.5s or 3.0s that we can get into school as the same type of athlete and it makes our overall team GPA higher. So the kid like that who's getting offers, who's a young kid who's very talented, the best thing they can do for themselves is now apply themselves in the classroom even more. And then at the same time, make sure they're enhancing their athletic ability, which should be an easier, easy thing to do. So when you're looking at schools, though, what, 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 do you, what should you look for? Coaching, the, what they do, academics, alumni, what, what kind of things I say should you look at? I say there's three phases that I, I tell all kids to look for. First, you have to make sure the social environment is what you want, because if you go to a place that you don't like, you're not going to want to go to class. A lot of kids from Florida come north. Orlando, Florida is a lot different from Piscataway, New Jersey, when I was at Rutgers. It's a lot different, all right? There's no Disney World at, in Piscataway, all right? And there's much nicer people down in Florida. So um, you need to understand the environment that you're going to and if it's what you want. Secondly, academics. The academic environment need to be what you want. Hopefully, I tell kids they need to have a game plan as far as what they want to get out of school. I was 33 years old when I retired from the NFL. So there's a lot of life to live after that. And if you're not setting a game plan as far as what you want, you know, it, life will come at you like a, a freaking you know, brick and it will smash you if you don't you know, prepare. But at the same time, that same brick that comes down could be a stepping stone for you to catapult yourself to the next level if you're prepared. I talk to my kids all the time about being proactive so they don't have to react. So like I said, we go to the social setting, then the academics, then lastly, athletics. The school should have the things that you want should play the brand of football that you want and the style of football that you want. Usually, in school systems, most of the time, coaches will come in and won't really change the dynamic of the offense or defense unless it's just that bad. But most of the time, if you get an opportunity to pick the school that you want, you mostly want to make sure that school has a brand of football, the style of football that you like. You know, if it's a, put it for instance, if it's a drop back quarterback who loves a pass, he probably shouldn't go to a Nebraska type school. You know, he should probably go to more of your, you know, your past happy type schools where they can really utilize, you know, what he does and the way he do it. So, um, and I think a lot of schools are, you know, picking it up. I mean, um, so it's just exciting to be able to, to see how football is transitioning. But for a kid trying to figure out which program they want, they need to first look at the setting of that school. So taking some unofficial visits. And one of the greatest things I got, we'll talk about it later in the book, in my book, The Student Athlete in College Recruiting, on page 82 in that book, I got specific questions that you should ask when you go on some of these recruiting visits, which I think helps the athlete. I wish it would have helped me. I was excited about just seeing the locker room and the fact that I could use a Gatorade machine in the locker room. I can get Gatorades whenever I want, right? That's a big upgrade from high school. Yeah. But um, there's a question. I would say get a kid on, from, from the team and ask a kid. One question I have in there is that, um, what's their high school size and hometown size to make sure you compare to that kid. But then more importantly, I would ask them, I would ask the kid on that team, I would pick any linebacker, DN, receiver, if it's a basketball guy, basketball player. At first I would ask them if they could do it all over again, would they pick the same school? Mm. I think that's a vital question to ask somebody. If you could do it all over again, would you pick the same school? Why or why not? And then I would ask them, have the coaching staff delivered on everything they promised you when they mm. were recruiting you since you've been here? And you think about those questions and what it can mean to a young athlete coming up, being recruited the same way this kid may have been recruited. And I don't say just look to the coaches because the coaches are like salesmen. And then they want to get you, hey, look at our school. Everything's going to look great. You're not going to go to a Penn State or a Pitt or a Michigan or a Michigan State and it's not, and it not look good. They're going to show you all the top things that's going to make you 
want to, you know, sign your name on a dotted line. The key thing that you should look for, though, is what are the players saying about the system that they're in? Go on the inside. Go on the inside and do a little bit of intel because you're going to be there for 40, four years of your life. Better make sure you get the right people around you. Yeah. So if, if the coach is selling you a bill of goods and you go to talk to these players and they're saying, I'm not really feeling this coach too much, that's going to tell you a story. It's going to tell you a story. Like this, kid, this coach is his friend. Now, all coaches got their uniqueness to them, but you don't have to be a jerk all the time. You know, if, if you're right. coaching you know, and it's really strong and, you know, but he's a good guy, it's different than being, you know, kind of a jerk and then not having any time for your athletes. Right. So, right. So you, you mentioned the word transition and it's an interesting word. Uh, what was your transition like from growing up in the Hill District, going to Shenley High School to the University of Pittsburgh? Very different. You go from being in classrooms of 20 something people to being in the classrooms of 150 or 200 some people. So that in and of itself, you know, leads to, leads to just learning how to study. Going from going through tests in the textbooks to having a syllabus, here's what you have, here's what you need to learn. So as we transition through life, we gotta learn to adapt with our situations. I can't say, well, I'm not used to this. It's either I go with the understanding, and one thing I tell all my kids is that coulda, shoulda, woulda means you didn't. I can sit here and say, well, I coulda did this, or I shoulda been here, but that just means that I didn't do it. So as I transition to the next phase from high school to college, what I understood is that there's more maturity involved. There's more of a regimented schedule that you're going to have to attain to. There's study hall hours that you need to set in from eight to 10 hours when you first get there. And then really, you got to really look forward to being able to utilize your time wisely. In high school, if you're smart, you can kind of you know, put some things off and still possibly pass the test when it's multiple choice. If it's not multiple choice, you got to come up with the answers from a textbook that you have to read on, on those. You're going to sit there with a blank page if you don't know. So there's, you really get, you really get, you know, um, kind of, you know, get in a situation where you have to know the information. And that transition means that I have to put in the time for studying. And, and with that, like I said, either I'm going to do it or I'm not going to do it. But time will tell when I go to take those tests. And I think that's the biggest transition that kids will have to get used to is their time management. I can't sit, really sit around and play video games. I can't sit around and talk on the phone. And now with the whole social media component, what people do there, maybe it could be a help as far as studying if somebody's, you know, I've got some notes that you may need. But at the end of the day, I think the biggest thing that was the biggest transition was learning how to come from the Hill District and inner city schools to now I'm in classes where, where set up where you get a syllabus, you read this textbook, you take notes in class, and now it's up to you to decide. I could, have, I could test you on anything in this chapter, and it's up to you to know the information or not know, but it's totally going to be on you. And there's only a couple tests in that semester, so you got to do well on those tests. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, well, at University of Pittsburgh, um, looking back, a playing career there, you know, mm -hmm. how, how do you feel that went for you, playing there? Well, I feel like, I still feel like I had the intangibles to play quarterback. I think that I was, um, as far as opportunity wasn't given the fairest opportunity, but I think that I made the most out of the situations that I was put in. And, um, you know, it was some hard times, you know, some tough times. And, you know, at the end of the day, every, every event that happened in college made me that much better of a professional which a lot of guys don't go through their college days and, and kind of if I could fast forward to, you know, my sophomore year where we were charting every pass and at the end of camp, I think I was like, I would, Pete Gonzalez was like 67%, I was 63% and Matt Lytle was like 47%. So they still made, named Pete the starter and Matt the backup. And I just was like, well, I'm a sophomore thinking I'm gonna have a year to to be the backup and everything. And they still named Matt because he said he had game experience from the previous year. And it was just kind of a blow. So I started playing safety. That was in 1997. We actually made the Liberty Bowl that year. And just like, you know, ever since then it was like, you know, I, I just always felt like even though I was there, I've had opportunities taken away. So I started playing safety, started playing some other stuff and it started working out for me. And it started panning out. And I was, I didn't realize how big of an athlete that I was at the time, you know, so. Um, my skip to my senior year, playing safety, playing some linebacker, get hurt, and then Ramon Walker, safety comes in and plays tremendous, getting turnovers, interceptions, and really played with reckless abandon, the way you should play safety. And um, 
And so they kind of went with him. And as I played in the last stadium at Pitt, you know, I really um, wondered, would this be my last college game? You know, I really didn't play that much later, later towards the year. I had a couple games where I had about, you know, eight to ten tackles, two, one or two sacks, a linebacker slash safety, and just really was just trying to figure out. I remember sitting there, and people were ricking up the field, and, you know, it was the last game at Pitt Stadium, and uh, we beat Notre Dame. And, uh, and I was just trying to figure out, you know, would I ever get a chance to play again? So I, you know, started raising my daughter, raising my um, – you know, and it was just going through life. I was doing juvenile probation and, uh, you know, working with a lot of inner city kids, you know, doing a lot of stuff as far as helping the family counseling and really start seeing, you know, kids that didn't have anything, um, no food, was dealing with all kind of abuse issues, ADHD, social anxiety disorder, um, all types of issues. And so I really started looking towards, you know, doing and helping them out. And the opportunity came up to play semi pro ball. And so I was doing that and I said, you know, I'll just start recording some of these games and getting footage and for the Pittsburgh team? Pittsburgh Colts, yep. And uh had a game where I threw for like six hundred something yards in one game, six touchdowns and ran another one in. So um after that the, the New York Dragons arena team has seen it and uh asked me to come up for a workout. So we're outside of the Giants bubble. I'm just throwing on this side. There's probably about three or four hundred something guys in there working out for this team. A guy just happened to be walking over to me and tripped right by me. And I helped him up. And I was about to laugh. I helped him. He's like, I was just coming over to tell you how good of an athlete you look. His name was Larry Ennis. He was um, the scout for the Giants. He said, well, do you have any footage from, or game footage from, you know, you playing? Now, all I did was just, was just cutting up tape at the time because I didn't know when I would need to use it. So yeah, I'll send you something when I get back. So I didn't know if to take it seriously, gave me his card. And, uh, you know, sure enough, you know, he called me and said, hey, we're going to fly you up here for a workout. Now, at the time, Sean Payton, who's now the head coach of the, co of the Saints, was a quarterback coach of the Giants. And uh, me and Rashard Casey, who was a former quarterback at uh, Penn State, were throwing. And I just, I just killed the workout. I mean, I did really, really good out through Rashard Casey. I was all the whole time, like, I'm... I'm going for a quarterback workout, but I never played really like a full game at quarterback in college. And Rashard Casey had this. I played against the guy when I was at, you know, Pitt. And, uh, you know, it was just it was kind of surreal. So I didn't know what to think of it. Coach said I did really good. We'll let you know. And, uh, you know, probably about, probably about a week later, I was driving up to Buffalo for another workout. Um, it was about five minutes outside of Buffalo, hit a patch of black ice. A truck flipped over about 40 or 50 yards. And Did you have your seatbelt on? I had my seatbelt on. So my expedition was the size of a Jeep, but I didn't know. The whole time I was going, I thought I was just sliding on the side. So I, um, I'm like, man, I can still push my truck over and still make this work out of Buffalo. That's how crazy I was. So then I get out there, I think about the movies I watched. I'm like, the truck may blow up. so I. I get out, I leave out the, the front windows totally gone. So I run for about 40 or 50 yards and I turn around and look at the truck and it's like just smashed up. And so I had on a white shirt and it was blood all over it. And the lady was an EMS uh, worker, happened to be right there. She was like, I called the ambulance, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm good. Like I was just kind of in shock. So all, and I walked away, when I looked at the seat, it was like a V right down over where I was sitting at. So I don't know how it didn't you know, impale me or whatever, but like I said, God has always you know, covered me. And I went to the hospital, everything was fine. Just walked away with this scar on my face. Like, that's where I get this scar at. Well, how crazy and how bad of a, you know, issue or how bad of a, you know, all the damage was. Because from hitting that black ice, or my truck flipped out, then it hit an embankment, and then it just started flipping. So I, it took me about maybe two and a half, three hours to drive back home. But on my answer machine at home, the New York Giants had called and said that, you know, want to sign you to a contract and send you to NFL Europe. So that would happen probably, they called me probably about 10 minutes after the accident, which was a day after my birthday. So anything could have happened. I could have broke an arm, a leg, my neck, died, and I wouldn't be sitting here before you today. But obviously there was a reason why, you know, God did continue to you know, keep covering me in that situation. And I started the whole NFL process after being hurt, not even really playing my senior year. 
um, sitting out of football a year, playing semi-pro ball, and then getting an opportunity to, at that venture. Then that was on to NFL Europe and did well over there, made you know, um, all honors, honorable mention teams and special teams and things and played quarterback and receiver and, uh, and then was back to training camp with the Giants. And so when you went to training camp, uh, you know, that's competitive. You got to make that squad. So how, how did that go? At that time, I didn't understand the numbers. I was, I ended up being a player rep for the Browns and for the Saints. So then when I started understanding the numbers of it, it kind of <laughs> started growing a little bit different. But my, my rookie season, um, Jeremy Shockey was just signed with the Giants. I didn't even know who was really drafted. And at the end of the day, um, I just remember thinking the best guys make the team. And I was my, my I didn't, never thought that I was going to be going back home. There was another option. Like, I knew I was going to make the team because I felt like I had not been given an opportunity all this time. So I was playing quarterback, went to training camp, two days, and all I would do was work. So I said, you know what, I, I feel like I blew opportunities in college. So I would wake up at 6 o'clock. I actually was beating Jim Fossil and Coach Payton to their offices. I was watching film. I was putting in the work. I was, you know, studying and seeing exactly what needed to be done. Um, after that, I would then, you know, uh, you know, train in the morning. So I would see everything that needed to be done, all the office formations, you know, what the reads were. And so uh, it was two days went past where I didn't get a rep in practice. And so the third day, um, Coach Payton said, I'm going to let you, you know, get in. Like, so it was a uh, um, waggle right. Um, X pal on Z Spear. And so when. You remember the play. I remember the play. Like, I just got a really. Like, my memory just goes just like that. So I um, remember doing the fake. I rolled around, and it was a. The receiver came in, went right back to the pal on, and I just let it rip. But he had really tight coverage. He had a guy underneath him and a guy over top of him. Ball went, fell right down in his, you know, over his shoulder for a 60 yard touchdown. And the coaches were like, wow. And I kind of started the whole, whole thing. So as I was going through camp, um, I just told the coach, I said, Coach, let me play special teams or something. I'm not getting a lot of reps. I'll make the team. So I started doing special teams practice. And I uh, had a game, the first game, I had about five tackles. <laughs> they were like, man, who is this kid? So then we were going through practice, and Dahani Jones, a linebacker, like, hey, man, you know, doing good. Let's just kind of take a blow to the play. And so I'm like, all right. And it's first and last time. So I, I, he comes off the ball and he grabs me and he throws me down to the ground, makes me look really bad. I'm like, got you. Like he was talking to me about taking the playoff until he can, you know, do good for a rep. So he set you up. He set me up. So the next play, I absolutely jacked him up. I lifted him off his feet and slammed him <laughs> the next play. And um, really didn't care. Like at that point, like I said, he, he, I felt like he set me up. So the coach loved that. The second, they liked the second play more than the first play. So we were actually playing against um, we were playing against uh, the New England Patriots, and at the time I was still leading the team in tackles. I think I had about in three games I had about eight tackles. Are you so playing defense or special teams? I playing special teams. Okay. And quarterback. So um, that's unusual. Yeah, very unusual. So I am um, playing against the Patriots in Giants Stadium. Kevin Folks back returning. We kick it, they kick the ball. And we punt the ball to him. I'm Jeff Eagles, you know, Kevin Folks looking up in the air, and I'm like, man, I just absolutely destroyed the guy who was covering me. Hit him, and I'm running out. I mean, I'm just flying downfield. I'm thinking, is this set up? And as I'm getting closer and closer to him, I'm realizing that nobody's around him, and he's going to try to return this ball. He's not waving for fair catch. And the second he caught it, boom, nailed him. And at the time, this was a, kickoff. This was a punt. A punt. punt a punt. So remember what the Giants' issue was the prior year was the fact that they lost to the Ravens and special teams was, was their issue. They didn't really have a special teams guy. So um, you blew him up. I blew him up. And when I got back to the sideline, Coach Foss was like, you just made this team, Darnell. Really? Yeah. After, from that play? From that play. I mean, I was already having a great camp, but I was leading the team through three games. It was the fourth game. We actually played five games that year because we played in a we played in the Hall of Fame game, the first game, um, and and that was the first year the Texans was in. That was the first year the Houston Texans. So he was just like, uh, 
wow, you're doing a tremendous job. And, and so that's kind of how. So that's the tipping point of your entrance into the NFL. That was the beginning of it all. So you had a great camp, but that hit opened up the door to that's play for the New York Giants. That solidified my spot. He didn't know where I was going to play. Because at the time, I was still playing quarterback. And we had Kerry Collins, Jesse Palmer, and Jason Garrett, who's now the head coach of the Cowboys. So mm. we had a very veteran, you know, solid quarterback and staff. I mean, quarterback, but, you know, there was no, they wasn't going to carry four quarterbacks. So that's when I transitioned, you know, after that to tight end. And then that was my first time ever really playing tight end in the NFL. So another transition. So then you play for them for, what, a couple of years? Yep, three years. And uh, where would you go next? To the Ravens. And how did that go? Went very good. Every school, every team I was with, I always played behind a Pro Bowl tight end. So with Shockey, he made the Pro Bowl when I was with the Giants. Then Todd Heap made the Pro Bowl when I was with the Ravens. And then um, Kellen Winslow made the Pro Bowl when I was with the Browns. And then Shockey didn't make the Pro Bowl with the, with the um, Saints, but we won the Super Bowl. So, so that, that helps. So, so talk about, like, at Pitt, was there anybody at Pitt that, you know, has been an influence to you as you move I mean, I really haven't kept, I mean, <laughs> other than like the secretaries, uh, Chris LaSala, um, Coach Junko, a lot of the coaches that was there when I was there have left. You got um, Ox, who's the equipment manager, and then Rob Blank, who's a, who is probably one of the guys who I looked up to the most. He's the head you know, trainer over there, and he's really helped with a lot of the transition and things that you know, I would go through, a lot of the injuries I would play through. But um. It really was just a matter of just getting in there and just doing the things that you need to do. But those people who were around the coaching staffs were more of an influence and helpful than the actual coaching staff was at the time. Interesting. So now you, you, play, you have this career in the NFL. You play for nine years. And, and what's your takeaway from being an NFL player? You played in the Super Bowl. You played for four teams. You know, you worked your way into the NFL from special teams and mm -hmm. a quarterback, which is unheard of, really. Yeah. So what's your takeaway from playing in the NFL? What could you talk about with that? I would say that it's a lifestyle, not a career. And in that, with the average career being 2.3 years, that in that lifestyle, you have to learn to set yourself up and prepare for life after football. Understand that most businesses, most NFL teams, sell the players. If, a, if an owner is willing to pay 50, 20, 60 million dollars for an athlete, then what are they bringing in? And how are they bringing it in? So then I started learning. I was on the, on the NFL boards and committees to start sending to Wharton School of Businesses and the Harvards and the Stanfords, going back to school, um, getting a business you know, degree or indoor license. So I went to the Wharton School of Business and I still remember it was me, Drew Brees, um, Ken Harvey, a ton of guys who are really into the whole business side of things. You went to the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. Yes. And um, we put together a program like a two week, you know, three week, they're extended now and just learning, you know, being able to get certified and, you know, to different business backgrounds, learning about LLCs, limited liability corporations, how to set up a business, um, how to have tax write-offs, how to do all these things that you need to do as far as setting yourself up, you know, for the future. Because one thing about this life, everything is business. There's somebody making this, you know, plant right here. There's somebody who's making this chair. Somebody who's making the cameras, making the lenses for the cameras, making suits, making microphones, making things. And every form of making those things has to go through a set business. So when guys understand that they're in a position with their, with their exterior, as far as what they are as an athlete, they can use that in the business world to create you know, revenue for themselves. <clears throat> so you have people, you have young kids that grow up and they have this dream to make it in the NFL. And you, you realize that. Mm -hmm. And you're sitting here saying that it's not a career, it's a lifestyle. So what you're basically saying is it's a stopover. It is. It's a stopover. It is. It's not gonna last forever. It is. And you have to have a backup plan. You have to. Look at Michael Jordan, and look at Magic Johnson. They've used their careers, their lifestyles, and created great careers for the rest of their life now. They're owners, you know, Michael Jordan's a billionaire now, Magic Johnson's a billionaire, you know, owning you know, businesses, owning land, owning, you know, running things, you know, so when guys understand that I can't run routes, I can't, you know, play linebacker, I can't play defensive end my whole entire life. 
But with this lifestyle, for this, whether it be a five-year career, whether it be a 10-year career, which is a long career in sports, but it's a short career in the workforce. And with guys in the standing to set themselves up for life through those things, you know, and not just say, well, I'm just going to, you know, go all out. And then once I'm done playing, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? You know, if that's the case at 33 years old, I'll be sitting here, you know, in the pickle as far as trying to figure out what I'm going to do. Yeah. So you, you, you have a lot of, I guess there's a lot of athletes that make it to the NFL from some difficult backgrounds, let's mm -hmm. just say. And so they, it's not like they were taught a lot of those things growing up. So you get to the NFL and you come from, in your case, you grew up in a hill district and you know the, the hard knock streets of the hill district. And so you get to the NFL and you're thinking, you made it, you made it, you're here. But what you came to learn is now serving you. I guess in my mind, I never felt like, you know, I've arrived. In my mind, I, I kind of worked opposite. I kept saying, well, when's going to be my last day? And if this is my last day, will I have enough to sustain me for the rest of my life? And that's kind of how I just constantly thought while I was in the NFL. Even whether it was a Super Bowl, whether it was, um, whether it was, uh, you know, the first game I played in, I always thought, you know, afterwards, because you see so many guys coming through and training and practicing, trying to figure, you know, is this it? You know, so, and if this is it, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. What am I going to, you know, put my hand on now? Because I can't just say, hey, I used to play sports and that's not going to get your job. What's going to get you a job is the six inches between your ears and what you, you know, learn and what you take in and what you continue to keep working at. Like I say, I feel like it's a lifestyle because it can set you up great. But at the end of the day, if you don't have anything else to back, fall back on, you will put yourself in a predicament where it's hard to sustain you know, a life. You know, before, before the interview, we had a chance to chat a little bit. And you said something to me that I've been doing this for 20 years. And I haven't heard anybody say this to me in terms of life is a series of transitions and we have to learn to adapt. So, you know, you've had the transition from the Hill District, Shenley, University of Pittsburgh, semi-pro ball, NFL Europe, NFL, and now what you're doing today, mm -hmm. Super Bowl, and now what you're doing today. So talk about how that applies to anybody really with transitions yeah. and how you have to adapt. You know, when we, when we come through this world, like I'm gonna relate to football first, you know, <clears throat> coaches will talk about you know, a 60 minute game, you know, or you, know, you, you gotta go through life like this. In a football game, you got first down, you got you know, third and one, you got backed up, you got you know, halftime, you got kickoff, you got you know, second and seven. Football is a game of ever changing situations and for each situation it prompts a different result. But at the end of the day, the better football players understand, understand the situation. Like if I'm a running back and it's third and two, I don't need a 30-yard run right now. I just need to gain you know, three yards to get the first down. If I'm a quarterback, if it's third and seven, I don't need a 50-yard you know, throw down the sideline. I just need to get eight yards in my pass. So I need to understand what the situation is. And that's the same thing with life. We're going to transition with so many things. The person I was in high school can't be the same person I am in college, the same person I am in my professional career. I'm going to lead to understand what things I need to do well and what things I need to cut out, whether it's you know, studying more, partying less, whether it's reading more, or whether it's just really maintaining the set schedule. So as I look at life, the more I've been able to transition and adapt to that situation, you know, when I was coaching, there was a certain requirement, there was a certain set schedule that I had to be regimented to. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't, didn't always wake up at five o'clock, but I had to start waking up at five o'clock now. I had to learn how to, you know, look at film and diagnose players. I had to learn to touch base with the parents and the athletic directors and the, and the coaches and get as much information on these kids as I needed to. Now I'm transitioning to the um, commercial property and, you know, residential you know, stuff and learning how to, you know, look at leases and walk through leases with a lot of the tenants and, you know, go over all the things that they want done in the you know, in the layout of a, you know, of a business and putting up drywall and taping and painting. So all these different transitions prompt a result, a different change for us. And I need to be able to adapt to those or else life will show you that this isn't what you're going to do and it's going to be hard for you to maintain a life. But the more you're able to transition, guys coming from high school playing, 
They were the top on our team. Now I'm going to a college team where I was once the top kid at a Central or a Shimley. Now I need to go to a Pitt or Penn State or you know, a Michigan. And now I need to prove my worth again. Now I got to start right back at the bottom of the barrel. And now I have to show what I can do. And I get so caught up in the midst of, you know, trying to, you know, do things that I can't do, but just playing my game. And if my game fits into the system, it's going to play dividend. And then once again, there's another transition. If you happen to go on and play in the NFL. Now, once again, you have to re reclaim your fame and redo all that you did to be that top high school and, and um, college player. And a lot of times for some guys, it's easy. For some guys, you know, you got to learn a new offense, learn a new system, but you have to be willing to adapt. And that's one of the biggest things and the reasons why this NFL draft is so big. I mean, I got a couple of NFL guys coming back who wants to train on the off season, you know, with me at my facility ethic because they are excited about the things that I helped them learn in the transition from college to the NFL. Timmy Wright, for example, a kid I worked hand in hand with, um, was a receiver slash hybrid at Rutgers. I loved him from the time I first seen him. Got an opportunity to go to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers as a free agent broke their uh, rookie tight end record at Tampa Bay. Then he got traded to the New England Patriots and, um, you know, obviously won the Super Bowl, was right behind Gronkowski. When Gronkowski was out, he had big games, two, three touchdowns in the game at tight end. So he's that new Hernandez type, you know, you know, tight end for them. But he's a very talented kid and will be coming back and doing some things. So when I help kids and players transition, and even with myself, it's about learning what will you need to know for the next phase. Once again, the whole proactive so you don't got to react situation is what I take into life in every phase. So you wrote a book. Tell us about why you wrote the book, what the book's called, and what you're trying to do with the book. Well, me and my <coughs> business partner, Rick Wire, who actually wrote the book, I put a lot, helped put a lot of information in there. What we do, we help the student-athlete transition from high school to college. How do you get to college? The student-athlete in college recruiting is what it's called. Um, and what it is, we sell it for $20. Um, you can go right on my website, www.dingusethictraining.com. If you want to you know, get it, once again, that's www.dingusethictraining.com. And in the book, they have everything from the compliance issues with the eligibilitycenter.org, um, the 16 core credits, the sliding scale with the SAT or ACT. And the biggest component in that book is for every single sport, football, basketball, uh, lacrosse, field hockey, softball, Baseball, swimming, track. We got the height, weight, and size for Division One, Division Two, and Division Three in there. So, for instance, if you're a baseball player, there's 11.7 scholarships for Division One baseball. There's about 30-something positions on the team, so there's a lot of partials. With that, um, they may take one shortstop, one pitcher, you know, that year. But with social media, you can look <coughs> and see how many players they got, how many seniors they got, how many seniors are leaving, which will open the opportunity for some income refreshment. But the biggest thing, for instance, for a kid who wants to find out about my book, for, if you're a right-handed pitcher, they want, if a right-handed pitcher for a Division One, they want you to at least be 6'1", 180 pounds, have an ERA of about you know, 2.0, and then have a fastball of about 80 to 90 miles an hour. Right there, realistic goals that a kid can set for himself. As opposed to Division Three or NAIA, they want you to at least be 5'8", 160 pounds, and have a 4.0 ERA, and 81 to 80 miles an hour velocity on your pitches. So right there, realistic goals that a kid can set and saying, here's what I need to get to if I want to be a D1 type player. So you're not just football players. You, and, and so if someone wants to train with you, uh, any kind of athlete in the uh, Pittsburgh metropolitan area, uh, how do they get, what do you do and how do they get in touch with you? Right now, we, we, build, <coughs> we do position specific training. And what we do, we go from the ground up. I'm going to start with your base and your balance. I'm going to go all the way through. So whether you are, we have a ton of lacrosse players, a ton of soccer kids, um, a ton of football players, obviously, basketball players and baseball players. Um, John Fecko's son, um, Christian and Kyler Fecko, actually train with us, and his daughter's actually training tonight, and she's a soccer player um, in softball. So um, Jennifer Ann Kowiak, a reporter, um, her son is a, a quarterback at um, Central. Central. Uh, Mike Navarro, him and Alex comes every week. So what we do, we build the athlete from the ground up, use a lot of resistant bands, do a lot of stuff, improving movement, teaching kids not to be waist benders, but knee benders. You play every sport with your knees and your base and balance. So if people want to find out right now, we train people down Pisa, Pittsburgh Indoor Sports Arena, in our ethic facility down there. We have a facility geared right towards us. 
Um, and our address there is um, 22 Rich Hill Road in Cheswick, Pennsylvania. Um, for more information on that, people can go to www.dinkinsethictraining.com or call at 732-887-3534. I see. So you're, you're training athletes on all kinds of sports. Uh, you wrote the book here. And I guess <clears throat> this is coming from you wanting to give back. Is that what it is? That is. Just wanting to give back and help kids <clears throat> in areas where I had struggled at. If I had some a little more information, I feel like I wouldn't have went through half the things that I did. But going through the things that I did made me the person that I am today. You know, we got the facility done at Pisa. We're building another one in Cranberry. Cranberry, that'll be coming up here pretty soon. And then on top of that, we got the massage business, Ethic Massage. And people can go to www.ethicmassage.com and get information on there. And they can still call the 732-887-3534 number. And for every phase, whether it's the training, rehabbing a person through massage and or you know, chiropractic stuff, um, we want to help athletes all the way around. Because I feel like if I didn't know the answers, I wasn't getting the answers from anybody else. I feel like it could be a resource for a lot of these young kids coming up, both athletically and academically. So you probably see kids from all walks of life. You probably see kids from affluent areas and kids that have no money. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you do. Money, no money, same issues. Parents don't know what's going on. Kids don't know how to get it done. And that's where I come in. And I, I can tell you kids in the Upper St. Clair area who you know, have issues as well as I can tell you kids in the inner city who have issues. But the complaint, the main situation is getting, getting the right knowledge and knowing how to disperse that knowledge. You know, anybody could tell you, well, you got to go do this and this and this. It's another thing on how you deliver that message to a kid so they can actually receive it. Well, Darnell, this, this hour just flew right by. Absolutely, it did. It flew right by. I just want to thank you for coming in and spending some time with us. Yeah. It's, it just seems to me like you're doing some really, really, and I know from a personal experience, some really good work <clears throat> with younger people. Yes. <clears throat> and, you know, I appreciate, <clears throat> excuse me, I appreciate what you're doing, and it probably gives you a lot of satisfaction. I it does. Assume. It does. I mean, I think that what is it, you know, Profit a man to you know, know a whole bunch of information and keep it all to himself. Yeah. I'd rather pass it on that some of the kids that I work with would then want to in turn help the next generation of kids coming up. Or to whom much is given, much is expected. Expected, exactly. And, and so, so I, I think you're really doing a lot of great things with the younger people. And, and, and I, I didn't know it was more than football. It sounds like it's every, everybody. Absolutely, yes. And it's academics and it's, it's a whole lot. Yes. It's a whole lot you're dealing with. And, you know, I, I just want to wish you the best of luck in what you're doing because it sounds like you're really touching a lot of lives. Thank you. And, uh, you know, uh, thank you again for coming. Yeah. And my, uh, my best wishes are, are with you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you for having me. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're thank welcome. You. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed this time that we've had with Darnell. And he's doing a whole lot of great things with the young people in the, in the Pittsburgh area. And I, I just want to ask you to please sign up and be an organ donor. <clears throat> If a, a family member or yourself ever needed, ever needed one to save their life, you would take it. So we all need to be organ donors and, and give that gift of life because uh, we're not going to need it as we move on. And I also want to thank you for watching. Please join us for another edition of One on One. Take care.